just uh, one little point on our readings, if I may, and then uh, we'll talk about our saint of the day and our hopefully future saint of the day as well. Uh, so it's very interesting what uh, Gamaliel here, the, this Pharisee, suggests to the other Pharisees there. Uh, it's, it shows this growing openness towards the disciples and Jesus, okay? So, uh, as we heard in the last couple of days, the, the, the apostles, they're, they're, they're preaching, and obviously part of their preaching is the fact that this man, whom you killed, was he through whom we worked this miracle. So, it came up regularly that the, you know, Jews are responsible for his death, that the Pharisees were responsible for calling out for his death. The Sanhedrin, the, the high priest, they demanded Jesus' death. So that comes up regularly in conversation, as one could imagine. So it made them feel somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, so this, this whole situation then becomes a bit perplexing, though, because we kill this Jesus, but there are good things happening in his name, miracles, and miracles that even we've seen and, and can't explain. I mean, Lazarus is alive. He was dead for four days. Uh, we saw that this man healed, uh, the, the cripple healed from, who was spent who knows how long at the side of the pool there waiting to be brought down. I mean, the, 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 the apostles uh, who worked miracles in Jesus' name. Okay, so Jesus worked miracles, now the apostles are working miracles. We want to explain all of this away, but it's not going away. In fact, if anything, they keep working miracles. So it becomes quite uncomfortable. Why? Because well, what they're talking about is very different to their own notion. Surely the Messiah would have come to free us from Roman occupation or would have come, you know, would have been a, an intelligent, uh, who knows, maybe even one of us, a scribe or a Pharisee. Uh, but this man, this man was from, from, from Galilee, from Nazareth. A carpenter's son. It's just nothing is matching up, but the signs, the miracles are there, and they can't deny them. So it's it's a kind of a, a frustrating thing. Like it, it shouldn't be the case, but it is. So Gamaliel he makes this very very wise suggestion. He mentions a few other leaders and let's call them spiritual gurus, uh, who gathered a little crowd around them. But then as soon as they were arrested or died. It all fizzled out. And he makes this very, very interesting point. What I would suggest, therefore, is that you leave these men alone, let them go. If this enterprise, this movement of theirs, is of human origin, it'll break up of its own accord. But if it does, in fact, come from God, you will not only be unable to destroy them, you might find yourselves fighting against God. That's a fairly powerful statement. Like, these are the Pharisees. They're the ones who are supposed to be teaching the law and drawing people to God. And now Gamaliel says, if, if, you, if you go against these guys and they actually are on the side of God, you may find yourself fighting God. Now, I find this really interesting in, in today's world because so often uh, someone comes out with, with new ideas or, you know, if we change the church's teaching on this, that or the other, everything will be fine. And they gather a crowd behind them and maybe even... It, it, it may even seem quite convincing, but what they're saying is against scripture and the teaching of the church. But yet, st even still, it'll gather a crowd, it'll gather support. There are all sorts of people doing this at the moment, you know, authors and other people who shall remain nameless, much as I'd like to. Um, oh, wonderful. So, uh, so, like all of these ideas that are out there, if we change this, that, and the other, everything will be fine. Okay, ordain whoever we want and change the church's moral teaching on, whoever, on, 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 on relationship sexuality and then all shall be well. Like, but the danger here is if, if we find ourselves changing God's law, we may actually find ourselves fighting against God. Do people realize that? I mean, if, if I change what scripture says and what the church teaches, I may actually find myself fighting against God. Now, how do you think that's going to work out? My odds are on the big guy. I think it's a safe enough bet, right? We're not going to win. And it's, it's kind of ridiculous to even try, you know? I remember when I was a, a kid, we used to visit uh, some friends of ours, and they had teenage boys. So I suppose they were 10 or 15, uh, between 10 and 13 years older than us. So when I was seven, I mean, he was 20, right? And we used to love play fighting. So we'd go outside in the lawn, and I was always convinced that eventually I'd manage it. 
<laughs> Actually, this guy, this, this guy. <laughs> I thought, well, if I could just, if I could just get in under him, if I could just, you know, and he just, and I'm swinging and swiping and swiping, and then he's trying to get, grab my head and go, boom. And that's kind of like fighting against God. Like, there's just no point even trying. It's ridiculous. So, like, these fandangled ideas and fandangled theologies and spiritualities will all pass. If they're not rooted in the Lord, they should all pass because they're not rooted in the truth. They're not rooted in God. And those who propose them actually are fighting against God. Okay. So, when we look at, on the other hand, two of our amazing women of today, uh, we have St. Bernadette of Lourdes and uh, Sister Claire Crockett. And there's, there's a link there which we hope to remember to draw in at the end. Uh, so, uh, St. Bernadette born in 1844, right, in abject poverty, the oldest of nine children. And I read an article about her there recently, and the way it was phrased was just so nonchalantly. Uh, she was a, the oldest of nine children, and most of her brothers and sisters passed away at a young age. It's just, it's just written that way, just most of them, most of them died. It was, it was so kind of, it was so commonplace to have, you know, infant mortality rate through the roof, also due to the fact that they lived in such poverty. Um, at the time of the, the apparitions there in Lourdes in, in uh, 1858, they lived in what was a jail, or what had been a jail, in a basement, right? So damp, dark. She had had uh, cholera when she was a kid and bad asthma. They said that's part of the reason she was quite small, four foot seven. Four foot seven. So a, a, a pint-sized little fighter, right? And uh, yeah, so a wonderful little character. Um, did learn to read and write, but not very well. Uh, her, she didn't speak French very well. She spoke the, the local dialect, uh, Occitan, I believe it's called. Uh, she spoke that, but not really proper French. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just really simple life. Really simple life. Something, something which is often forgotten about this grotto in Lourdes. We hear about the grotto, oh, the grotto, the grotto, the candles, and the river flowing through it, and you know, the little cliffs, and all oh, looks lovely. See, the, the, the grotto back in the day was the dump, right? Because it's near a river, so it's going to carry the stuff off. And um, it was a, a cliff thing, so you couldn't climb up it or you couldn't build on it. So they just horse things, throw things over, over the cliff and dump them there. There was also um, a, a form of a hospital in the locality, and that's where they would dump the various organs, severed legs, whatever it was. They would throw them down there. So when they were going for firewood, one of the things that they would actually pick up was also bones for the fire, okay? So this is like, again, we, we were, can often romanticize what was, oh, she went skipping into Massaville to pick, pick firewood. They went to the dump, all right, to get stuff to burn. That's where, where that's the kind of poverty that they were, that they were living in, okay? So, crossing into the dump and then branches, whatever, like people had cut off clearing trees and clearing fields. They'd hop, dump all of this stuff into the, into the grotto there. So then th that's, where they, that's how they got the firewood there. Okay, so they bring all this stuff home and then, and then burn it. Like it's you know, abject poverty, really. So uh, her, her dad was a, a miller, so didn't make a, an awful lot of money. And good faithful people but again just a hard life hard hard times hard hard times so uh, when she went to the the grotto then there were two uh, such silent apparitions first where she sees our lady but doesn't hear anything just sees this beautiful lady she doesn't refer to her as our lady as, as we do but just the beautiful lady all right so and she sees us just this this supernatural just light and beauty emanating from her white clothes, white uh, shawl, blue sash, and two roses on her feet. And so, on the third apparition then, a lady asks her to return for a fortnight, so for 14 days consecutively. There were 18 apparitions in all, in total. And on the second last one, so the 16th, she reveals her identity and says, I am the Immaculate Conception. Now, while this had been announced as a dogma four years previously, uh, for a, a girl of that age, who was 15, but a, gir a girl of her education more than anything, to even know what Immaculate Conception was, even today, even today, if you ask your average junior star student, you know, name a couple of 
the Marian dogmas that we have today. I mean, how many are going to mention, oh, yes, the Immaculate Conception? I mean, that would be exceptional today after 10 or 12 years of Catholic education, but of Catholic education. But for her, so when, when the parish priest asked her, you know, who did you see? And she said, uh, she said, Our Lady said she was the Immaculate Conception. So where did you hear that? She said, you know, he asked her, do you know what that means? And she said, I have no idea. I've been saying it the whole way from the grotto to here. I've been just repeating it over and over again. I have no idea what it means. Just to remember it, you know. So that was a confirmation for him, the, the parish priest, that something supernatural was happening here. One of the events which, when we read the, 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 the uh, accounts of the apparitions, one of them which, which, which stands out as again, a bit uncomfortable for us uh, in our 21st century psyche to, to read, is the occasion in which Our Lady asks Bernadette to drink from the stream. Okay, now there's the Gav, the river, running behind them. Okay, if you've ever been there, so there's the river which is all nicely walled and bridged and that now. It uh, wasn't quite as pretty then, but the river was there. Um, there was a stream running down from a mill, which has since been diverted, and there was a, a muddy area, just marsh. Like I said, the, the river wasn't walled as it is now, so it was just a sopping wet kind of dirty place. So Our Lady indicates to her, drink from the stream. Now you would imagine, if you were there, if I were there, uh, I would look around and say, well, there's the river, it's obviously that, and head towards the river. Our Lady says, no, not there, and indicates with her finger a, a, a spot on the ground. Now, this wasn't the first apparition, so crowds had, again, there was no TV, there was no, what do people watch? I was going to say Love Island, no one watches that anymore. Big Brother, whatever, I don't know, what's, what's whatever, no nationwide, nationwide, good show. Uh, there was no nationwide to watch in the evening, uh, so people, people gathered, and they gathered, I suppose, for all sorts of reasons, curiosity, religiosity, so a crowd had gathered around her, so she sees Our Lady, no one else sees or hears what's happening. Our Lady indicates a drink from that spot, so she says, she's heading towards the river, Our Lady says, no, that spot there. And so she goes, and it's, it's a puddle. It's a puddle. Now, you imagine this crowd looking at her going, what's she doing? And she puts her hands down into it, forms a kind of a cup. The first two were so muddy, there wasn't even water there, right? Enough, or enough water to actually drink. So the third one then, there's kind of enough water, and she goes and she drinks. You can imagine all the people looking on going, she has lost her mind. And so then the, the rumor goes around fairly quickly, she's crazy. Our lady also asks her then to eat some of the grass. Again, we read that and we go, sorry, what? Uh, you know, it's just so, so strange. So strange. Okay, now what is the point? Because there is a point, there's always a point. There's always a point to these things. Our lady doesn't do these things randomly. So what is the point? From that spot where Bernadette drank, that's where the spring came forth. That's the spring that people go to today. You know, millions of pilgrims have, have passed through uh, in the meantime. That's where, that's the miraculous spring where uh, a couple of days later, a lady with a withered hand, so a hand that was atro muscular, had muscular atrophy, all the muscles had um, basically shriveled up, uh, bathed, just felt internally drawn to bathe her, her arm in this, in this spring and, and it was healed. And that's the first of many uh, miracles, 69 of which are actually investigated and, and attested to, but there, there are far, far more uh, in reality. So point being, act of humility, grace. You know, act of humility, act of simplicity, simple obedience, and grace comes from it. Okay? Uh, that's, it's just, I think even today, <clears throat> in our own lives, when we, when we do the same, I think we will see the same. The Lord asks us to do something, just do it. Just do it. The grace will follow afterwards. You mightn't see why. Even when it comes to Mass, prayer, <clears throat> devotions, confession, any of these things. You might think, well, I mean, do we really need to? Do we really have to? But from these simple acts, grace flows when they're done in obedience to God. Sister Claire Crockett, uh, she's, I, I forgot to actually mention yesterday when I was talking about her that um, she... She's a sister of the home of the mother and uh, a wonderful example to modern day young people having at least the, the beginnings of, of a career 
uh, as an actress uh, working on, on children's TV programs, has a profound experience on, on Good Friday Kissing the Cross and discovers that she never really knew how much God loved her. Wants to become a sister, becomes a sister, uh, excels especially in obedience. Her obedience to her superior, again, not in a, in, a, in, a, in a cultish kind of a way, but Lord, I want to do your will, so show me through my superior <coughs> what your will is. She wants to excel uh, in, in, in obedience, and she did. She did. So much so that, as we said yesterday, her mother's superior uh, on one occasion said, um, I never knew what she liked to do and what she didn't like to do because she did everything with such joy. Just, just served and, and, and gave uh, so much so that I didn't know what her actual likes and dislikes were. It's, it's, it's a wonderful compliment. <clears throat> My sister Claire writes, The Virgin Mary is so great. I do not know how to explain how much good it does me to be with her and just look at her. She spoils me in a way that leaves me speechless and makes me feel very, very small because I realize that she is the one who guides my life. <clears throat> I asked her for the grace to be crazy about her. That's a very dairy, dairy way of saying it. I asked for the grace to be crazy about her and to always do whatever she asks of me. There are things the Virgin Mary can ask of us that seem absurd in the eyes of the world. But I know I have to be willing to take that step and even make a fool of myself if she asks me to. She asked St. Bernadette to eat grass in the grotto. Did she do something crazy or absurd? No. She knows what she's doing. So Sister Claire pushed herself, pushed herself hard for love of God with her, all of the souls entrusted to her care, also in Ecuador, where she was a missionary sister and where she died in an earthquake in 2016. She emptied herself for love of God. I have no doubt the Lord has rewarded her with eternal life and with the help of God we'll see some, some miracles uh, attributed to her so we can formerly uh, bring people there and to learn from her life and learn from her example. You see the difference between these two girls, these Sister Claire and Saint Bernadette in comparison to many modern authors or, or speakers whose approaches are very, very different. Sister Claire and St. Bernadette, who through simple obedience and humility begin to renew the church, actually renew it. And others then who through, dare I say, arrogance and we know better than God, propose all of these popular ideas that aren't from him. Who's on the side of God? And this, I'm not saying this uh, in any, with any sense of, of, of judgmentality, but just we look at the facts is what you're saying coherent with, with the Lord's teaching or not? Through humility we see grace flow. Through simple obedience we see grace flow. Through getting out of the way, getting our ego out of the way, we become a channel for grace through which the light of the Lord can flow into other hearts. So we ask the Lord today to continue to renew his saints, his church as he always has done through saints, through saints. And that we, Lord, if it be your will, may be those saints as well, that we may serve you in humility and get out of the way so that grace can flow through us into the hearts of all who need it. Amen.